I will praise you, O Lord, with all my heart. I will praise you before all the little gods of this world and let them know that you, O Lord, are the center of my life. I will bow down and worship you and praise your name, O Lord, for all your unfailing love and faithfulness. When I call upon the name of the Lord, I felt peace and answer and emboldened in my walk with God. May all the powers of this world praise you, O Lord, and may we all join in singing of the greatness of the Lord. Even in the mightiest of the Lord, the Lord looks kindly upon the lowly and takes notice of the proud from afar. Though I walk at times in the midst of trouble, the Lord looks kindly upon me. The Lord's presence protects me from the things of this world that would do me harm. Your love, O Lord, endures forever, and you will not forsake the work of your hands. I will praise you, O Lord, with all my heart. I will praise you, O Lord, with all my heart. I will praise you, O Lord, with all my heart. I will praise you, O Lord, with all my heart. I will praise you before all the little gods of this world to let them know that you, O oh Lord, are the center of my life.
Lord God, maker of heaven and earth, we gather together in your name. We come as living sacrifices to offer you our worship and thanksgiving, our praise and our prayers. So come among us, living Lord, through the power of your Holy Spirit. Transform our hearts and minds as we gather in worship today so that we may recognize your presence, hear your voice, know your will, and walk in your way. Unfailing God, today we lift our hearts to you in one voice as we pray. We, we praise, praise you as the giver and transformer of our lives, Lord. Rouse us from our complacency and static faith as you change and renew our lives day by day. Give us your mind, God, that we might see you more clearly, love you more dearly, and follow you more nearly. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Welcome to worship at First Baptist Church of Asheville. We are so glad that you're worshiping with us this morning. Guests, we're especially glad that you're worshiping with us. And we would ask that after the service, you take a few moments to go on our website, fbca.net, and fill out a form. It's on the Worship This Week, Week page, and you'll find a guest connection form. We would like to know of your visit with us today, and that'll give us some information about you. We'd like to be in touch with you this week by mail to give you more information about our church. Now, while you're there on the website, take some time and look at the mission and ministries of our church. There's a lot going on here, and we would like to involve you in all of that. Friends, if you have a prayer request, you can also go to that page, and there's a prayer request link. We would like to know about your joys and your prayer request. So take time to fill that form out for us. And then one of the ministers will be in touch with you this week to pray along with you. We miss you and we can't wait for the day that we're all back together in this place. This week, I have been thinking about and praying for students and teachers and educators, all those who work in our educational system and I've been thinking and remembering how it is to send children to kindergarten for the first time or to college for the first time. These days are anxious and exciting, but in the midst of all that we have going on, we have peace that we can share with each other and we get that peace from our relationship with Christ. So whether you're worshiping with people right now in your home or if you're worshiping by yourself, we want you to know that we're sharing the peace of Christ with you today, and we're gonna ask you to share that with each other. If after worship, if you're worshiping alone, if after worship you would call somebody and share that peace, I know that they would appreciate that too. So friends, let's stand now and share the peace of Christ with one another. Speak, O oh Lord, as we come. 
The epistle lesson for today comes from Paul's beautiful letter to Rome. Listen for the word God speaks afresh to us today. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and not all the members have the same function, so we, who are many, are one body in Christ, and individually we are members of one another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, prophecy in proportion to faith, ministry in ministering, the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, to God. be to God.
when I was a little kid, and even into my teenage years, I remember what a refreshing feeling it was to move the furniture around in my bedroom. Uh, you probably know what I mean. Uh, you get a little bit bored with your bed being over in this corner and your desk being by that window and the chair being over near the door. So one day you just get up the energy to move the bed to the other side of the room and the desk against that wall. And well, this was just a habit of mine. And I don't know, every six to 12 months, I would be in the mood to, to move the furniture around and find a, a nice way for the natural light to hit my desk in the afternoon. Now the bed's by the window, and I like the way the room's arranged. It's more open now. You know, I might keep it this way for as many as six more months. Fast forward to today, Aaron and I have been slowly but surely renovating a fixer-upper. Emphasis on the fixer part. You'd never know it from the outside looking in, but the interior is significantly updated from what it was four years ago. I will confess that this experience has not been as pleasurable as moving my furniture around as a kid. Renovations are hard work. They're hard work even if you're not the ones doing the actual work. Raise your hand if you've ever renovated your kitchen, hired a crew, come in, take out all the cabinets and all the appliances, and, well, I don't mean to stir up a bad memory for you, but probably what you would rather have done than stay in your house throughout that ordeal was to move out for the entire duration of the renovation. Some of our neighbors just moved back into their house after just renovating their kitchen and living room. They've been gone for five months, and they hired a crew. We come to a scripture passage today that holds within its verses one of the most profound invitations to renovation in the New Testament. Be transformed by the renewing of your minds. In just this phrase alone, we find one of Paul's most direct descriptions of the power Christ's resurrection holds for us now in the present. Here is Paul not merely witnessing to the power of Christ's resurrection as a historical reality. Paul is not merely establishing the grounds of hope in the resurrection in the future. Rather, Paul is asserting the resurrection's power to well up within the present. He is pointing to the imminence of Christ's resurrection. Resurrection happening now, beginning in the deepest depths of our minds and in our hearts. Paul invites us to recognize how Christ's resurrection can affect the renewing of our minds, the refurbishing of our intellect, the restoration of our faculties, the revitalization of our judging and feeling and perceiving. With wisdom and passion, he bears witness to the capacity for a human being to participate, to be drawn into the past and the future resurrection, all while being in the present, here, today, right now. One of the most fascinating areas of scientific discovery in recent decades has to do with the way the brain functions. Our brain matter is so mesmerizing and so mysterious, you'd think some of the peer-reviewed studies about it were written for science fiction movies. One of the most interesting things about our brains has to do with the way that we learn. Our brains are home to about 100 billion neurons and even more what are called uh, glia, which means glue in Latin, but it's more than glue, all functioning together to send and receive the signals of our thoughts and feelings, our memories and our instincts. We know that we learn new things by creating new neurons and new pathways between neurons. When you're studying for your test, your brain is doing something called neurogenesis. It works better if you don't do an all-nighter but that's what's happening in your brain as you're going through the flashcards and memorizing tables. 
where new neurons develop in the hippocampus and new roots are established between neurons that previously weren't connected. All of that's happening when we're learning. Now, I can't tell you what the medulla oblongata is doing all this time, but amongst the neurons and the glia, something new is happening as we learn, as we experience. The hippocampus is very busy when our minds are being transformed. Which is to say, when you're learning, when you're reading, when you're studying, and you feel like you're making new connections, that's actually happening on a physical level in your brain. Your brain is physically altering as you go. Even older adults, I can hear you now, I, I hear you on the other side right now saying, not my brain, my brain's retired. No, even your brain, even as we age, neurons continue to develop, New connections are made as long as we're living and learning. Our brains are going through metamorphosis. Incidentally, that's the word Paul uses here. To be transformed by the renewing of our minds is to experience metamorphosis of the way we perceive reality. It's fascinating that Paul uses the word metamorphosis here because he doesn't use it anywhere else in his letters. We only find it here and then one other account in the New Testament, and that's in Matthew and Mark's account of the transfiguration. At the transfiguration, Peter, James, John, disciples, just a few of them invited to the special unveiling, stand dumbfounded and slack-jawed as Jesus' face goes through a metamorphosis, is transfigured before their eyes. Jesus goes through this metamorphosis, his face is transfigured, his clothes shine as bright as the sun. What is happening in this moment? Is it nothing more than a revelation of the full divinity of Jesus Christ? Well, in part it is that. But isn't it also a glimpse of his future resurrection? I believe that to see Jesus' metamorphosis in this moment is to see the future fold back onto the past, on into the present. At the transfiguration, God is also giving us the gift of seeing an astonishing glimpse of our own destiny of being raised with Jesus. And in the inner recesses of our minds, tucked into the folds of our brain matter at levels that are invisible to the naked eye, these little sparks of metamorphosis, of transfiguration, these little promissory glimpses of resurrection are sparkling inside of us. Each one of us, as we're being transformed by the renewing of our minds. May I ask you a personal question? Has your mind changed about anything lately? Say in the last five months? The things you think and believe today, are they the same as what you thought in March? What about in the last year or the last five years? Woe to those about whom it may be said, my mind is made up, I know all I need to know. But part of what it means to be Christian is to live ever presently in this mode of metamorphosis, a telltale sign of faith is not a grasping for certainty or a settled satisfaction in the way things are, but a plasticity of the mind, an ever-ready capacity for transformation. This is not to say we should be so open-minded that we never arrive at any convictions, but it is to say that to be a Christian is to have an ever-ready capacity to discern whether some of our convictions are really just prejudices, or lazy thinking and hiding. How will we know if we're being transformed by the renewing of our minds? When we witness something that illuminates the darkness. When we experience something that leaves us speechless. When we discover something that scares us at first, but then it captures our imagination and then we can't let it go and it leaves us a different person than we were before. When something asleep inside of us wakes up, when something we learn is life-giving, not just for us, but for others, 
When something dead in our hearts or minds is resurrected, when we look back on who we used to be and we thank God, that's not who we are anymore. We are being transformed by the renewing, the metamorphosis, the little resurrections of our minds. I've told some of the story before of Ann Atwater and C.P. Ellis, both residents of Durham, North Carolina. There's a, a play about their enemy status transforming into friendship. Ann Atwater, a black Durham uh, member of the Durham uh, community. C.P. Ellis, a poor blue-collar worker, member of the Klan. Ooh, he and Ann Atwater hated one another. But as the story unfolds, we see them continue to encounter one another. And one night at a rally, a community meeting, everyone's singing a hymn, and C.P. Ellis is sitting down, and Ann Atwater just happened to catch his knee bobbing up and down to the gospel hymn. And she thought to herself, we got him. Well, it wasn't just the gospel story that got C.P. Ellis and changed his mind about race and friendship and what it means to be a, a white man in the South and friendship with a black woman in a place like Durham, North Carolina. It was that C.P. Ellis learned he learned that he had so much more in common with Ann Atwater than he previously thought. He learned that they had both grown up poor. They both grew up disadvantaged, and they both grew up being played against each other by the powers and the principalities of their time. And as his relationship, his very rocky, fiery relationship with Ann Atwater, turned from hostility to friendship, you can almost see the synapses firing in his brain and the new neurons being created, new pathways, new glimpses and sparks of resurrection. Interestingly enough, what stirred up my memory of this story was a recent uh, paper of our own church's history that our church historian Wayne Caldwell offered to a, a Sunday school class just a couple of weeks ago in which he recalls moments in our church's history long ago, long ago, when members of our church were regarded as blue class and poor black. Now, we used to have many black members back before the Civil War. Of course, uh, they had been enslaved black people in our community, and it's not clear how much power and how equal they were, though let's be frank, it was not a relationship of perfect equality here. However, there seemed to be a recognition in the community that our congregation was made up of blue collar people and black people, just enough so that we got nicknamed the Drat Shot Gang. Now, I don't know about you, but I think that's a great nickname for a church. I don't know what we do with Drat Shot Gang, but we at least got to rename our softball team. Ah, the Drat Shot game. Perfect name for a congregation. It can lean back into its history, lean forward into the future, and enjoy in the present a being transformed by the renewing of our minds. Paul did it. He changed his mind so much he changed his name. There's even moments in Scripture where God changes God's mind. I know in my own experience it feels good looking back on it, knowing that my mind has changed. I don't even want to go back to 2015 Mac. Come to think of it, I don't even want to go back to March 2020 Mac. Come to think of it, 
I sense God is calling me right now to go move some furniture around. I'm in. What good news it is to know that just recently we baptized two new members of our own. What good news it is to remember that we, who've already been baptized, remain saturated by the waters of this sacrament in ways that redeem our identities and renew our imaginations. May we live into this new creation our destiny in Jesus Christ, who's raised from the dead. May we also live into it with every dimension of our life, from our learning to our giving. I thank each one of you for the ways that you are being transformed by the renewing of your minds, shaping all of us to be a community of resurrection together. May we continue to learn, to give, to share, all while doing so, knowing of the deep power of the ways we're being transformed by God's Holy Spirit.
Sing praises to the Lord. Give thanks to his holy name. Father, please accept these gifts as a small portion of our love for you. Guide us as we use these gifts to help those in need. Thank you for our staff, church leaders, and volunteers who give themselves to minister to our church and community at a time when physical contact is limited. And finally, thank you to our faithful members who continue to provide support for this good work. In your glorious name I pray. Amen. Friends, just over five years ago, August 1st, 2015, our congregation welcomed to the church staff our distinguished organist, Mr. Tate Addis. And we celebrate his ministry among us for the past five years. Tate has not only adorned our worship services with beauty and majesty, poignant moments of artistry, but he has also gathered our community in this very space monthly, on a monthly basis for box lunches that have become quite popular. In fact, Tate's views of box lunch even outnumber our worship views. However, Tate is also a wonderful teacher, a much sought, off, a much sought teacher of organ and piano in our community. He's a friend to our staff and to our congregation, and we want to show our gratitude to him for the beauty of his ministry among us these past five years. Tate, we offer you this certificate of appreciation as well as a $5 coupon for Burger King for the, their new Impossible Burger. I know you like those. So perhaps for our opportunity for continued response this week is simply to remember those who adorn our lives with beauty, to remember them and to show appreciation for them wherever we can. In the spirit of Christ, dear friends. things my hand is on my heart for you for the love of our church for the love of our city for the love of the whole world for the infinite beauty of God opens before us as the Spirit prepares us to be sent out to love the world in Christ's name 